Hello, my fellow Extraordinary Americans. My name is Cosmos Dar, and this is Extraordinary America. What is Extraordinary America? Well, you see, America has always been about freedom, opportunity, and the pursuit of happiness. However, most Americans are not free when it comes to the financial front. Most Americans are suffering from financial slavery due to loss of jobs, stagnant wages, inflation, and debt. Wealth and income inequality is the norm now, and the middle class has all but disappeared. So, Extraordinary America is about the abolition of financial slavery. It is about the financial freedom of the 99%. It is about the nation of immigrants and the descendant of immigrants restoring the extraordinary within themselves and setting themselves free. The path to financial freedom is through financial education. It is through becoming entrepreneurs and investors on the light side. In this podcast, I interview fellow Americans who fought against the odds, many of whom came from humble beginnings to see how they did it. It is my hope through these interviews that the extraordinary within you shall awaken and that you will abolish financial slavery from your life and realize the American dream. Once again, welcome to Extraordinary America. Welcome back to the show, my fellow Extraordinary Americans. For today, we have a special guest called Don Sevcik. Don is the creator and founder of Math Celebrity, the fastest math tutor on the planet. Math Celebrity helped 8.1 million people with 101 million math problems last year. In one year alone, the site got 3.5 million unique visitors from 230 countries. He's a best-selling author of five books, which are on Amazon including Free Traffic Frenzy, How to Get 450,000 Website Visitors. He also consults on SEO and business automation. Don is a really unique, extraordinary American, and I'm honored to have him on the show. Don, are you there? Hey, I'm here. Glad to be here. Hey, Don, it's an honor to have you on the show. Um, I know that you are. Uh, I know that you are basically the founder of Matt Celebrity, and can, can you tell me and the audience a little bit more about yourself and your story and how you got to the point, like from the beginning to how you got to the point where Matt Celebrity became the success that it is? Yeah, back in 2007, I believe it was June, June or July of 2007, I was working a day job as a programmer. And me and my colleagues just started getting frustrated because when we get our annual reviews, where you get you find out your raise and bonus, the feedback would be really good, but your raise and bonus would only be, say, 3 to 4%. And no matter what you do, it almost feels like it was a carrot being dragged in front of you and you could never get promoted. So anyways, I to, to branch out and maybe make some more money, I started math tutoring people on the side because that was my major in college. And so one student turned into two, two turned into four, four turned into six. Now, the fun part was the feedback was was really good, but the, but the trouble, as you can imagine, is it's hard to scale an in-person business. So I went back home because I was married at the time and I had a day job. So I asked myself, how could I scale this? And I was racking my brain for a week to, to how to do it. And anyway, I'm back at my, my day job and we had to figure out, we were working with a team in Gurgaon, India on how to build a program to calculate American pensions for American pensioners. And my boss had set them this big 300 page, just dry book. And they, they just weren't getting it. So anyway, my manager asked, is there a better way to do this? So I said, yeah, let me, let me try something. I built an Excel spreadsheet with all the formulas the team in India would ever need to know. But, but the catch was next to the cells that showed the numbers, I had dynamically updating math. So like A times B to get this value. And when I sent that to the team in India, they instantly went, I get this. This makes so much sense. And when I saw that reaction, the light bulb went off in my head. And I said, if I can do that for pensions, why couldn't I do that for math tutoring? And so that's that's kind of how I got started. Wow. So, so Don, it's, it's very unique. Like, not many people can actually succeed in SEO and getting millions of visitors onto their website. Like, this is the one thing that businesses all across the world are earning for, like in the 21st century. Like everybody wants to know, how do you get unique visitors to your website? So like, uh, what was the, so my question to you is like, what is the process that you uh, like from start to finish where like you got, uh, you managed to get it from like 10 visitors to a hundred visitors to a thousand visitors. Like, was there like a secret formula or something or was it, is it just something that happened organically? 
part of it was organic, but part of it was stumbling on some interesting discoveries. I always remember, I forgot which scientist it was that said, you know, you're on the verge of discovering something incredible. Not when you say Eureka, but you, when you say, hmm, that's interesting. Something that, sh that doesn't add up, but you're seeing it in real time. So when I first got started, we maybe had like five or 10 visitors a week. And I knew nothing about SEO and even less about developing websites. So the first year or two, users would trickle in. But then what I started doing is I asked myself, how can I scale attention? And so what I did is I found a couple of math help forum sites. And by sheer luck, I stumbled upon one that was already getting millions of visitors. And I contacted one of the admins of the site. And I said, look, I got a math tutoring site. I'm not selling anything. Do you mind when I answer questions and help people with math that I attach a link to a calculator that'll explain the math too? And the guy said, yeah, as long as you're not selling nothing. So I started answering questions. And I think I got to the point where it was like 25 or 30 of my calculators were included in the math help. I think it was mathhelpforum.com's answers. And anyway, I went to bed one day and I woke up and, and I got an email that, that said your traffic has spiked. And so I looked and what happened was Math Help Forum shot up on the Google SEO to number one for the term synthetic division calculator. That was the exact term. Wow. So when they when they when they search for that, people would click into the Math Help Forum, see me explain a problem, but then they would see a link to my calculator at the bottom. Well, the double whammy happened over two more weeks after that. What happened was when they Google synthetic division calculator, the math help form that I posted in was number one. I guess it was number two, my synthetic division calculator. And wow. so what happened is it only took probably three or four of those calculators to start getting attention from 10 or 20 visitors a week to hundreds and then a couple thousand. But the real scaling happened when... I opened Google Analytics and I, and because I didn't know this right away, but Google Analytics has this thing. I think it's called like site search and you can turn it on and tell it like the name of your search box on your site. So for WordPress, I think it uses Q. I use Q too, but the, the point here is it will track every search ran on your search box on your site. Well, why is that valuable? Because now you know exactly what people are asking for on your site. You may create, like I may create a calculator that says, algebra equation help, but 92% of the people that run a search on my site ask for it like this, one-step equation help or two-step equation help. Once I know how they ask for a problem, I can restructure my page to change my title. I can change it for Google. So now when people search for one-step equation on Google, it's in the exact language that they would have searched on my site. So the internal site search is basically a cheat code. It's almost like, what if you could put your ear to the wall and here are three, four, five, six million people that need your help, but you listen to the exact way they ask for a Google search, and then you just put that on your site. Wow, this is this is incredible because like basically this is what most companies are trying to understand. Like, how do I increase my SEO, uh, and how do I get more sites to the visitors? And then basically it's about Google and analytics. You have to know what people usually search for, and then type it type it accordingly. So. Yeah, another big part of that, too, I would add is speed is another thing that every business has to be aware of. So the average attention span, according to I think it was that Harvard study for humans is eight is at eight point two five seconds, which is one second lower than a goldfish. So what that means is if your page takes four or five seconds to load because it's clunky, you now only have three and a half seconds to get their attention before they click off. And Google is watching to see if you run a Google search, you click into a site. If you click off within 30 seconds or come back to Google, they're going to penalize you because they know your content wasn't valuable. And one of the reasons people will leave is because things take too long. So if you can get get them something simple, clean, and fast, you will move up fast on Google. I, I see. Uh, so can you like elaborate on how to like how would you uh, go about doing that? Like where you create something clean, uh, small, and fast. The easiest way to start for free is to use Google's page speed analyzer and just take your URL and paste it in there. And in about seven to 10 seconds, they'll give you a readout of, we analyzed your page, this loaded fast, this loaded medium, this loaded slow, and please fix these things right away. That's not just for your health, by the way, that's them telling you almost indirectly, fix these things and your rank will go up. So the Google page speed analyzer is an incredibly useful and free tool. And a lot of it is just based on speed. So sometimes you may try to load a file in the background 
but it's just too bloated. So if you trim it down or change the way you load the file, you may see a big increase in speed. Well, increase in speed plus um, user validity, meaning when the user came to your site, did they get what they want? And sometimes did they get even more? And then is your, even as your language simple, so I don't know if you're familiar with the Flesh Kincaid score, but it's a score developed, it started by the US Navy for readability. <clears throat> and when I, and I had met a company that does a billion dollars in sales named Agora, I don't know if you've heard of them, but they sell books and they sell newsletters, two of the most boring products on the planet, but they do a billion dollars combined with all their, with all their divisions. And when I flew out to Orlando for one of their conferences years ago, one of the big messages they talked about, and, and, and they don't do SEO, but this applies to SEO, is whenever they send out a sales promo and after they've rewritten it 30 times and everybody's looked at it, the key point is, is this written at a fifth grade level or lower? Because you don't want to confuse anybody. Because if you, if you send it to a professor, maybe they can read it at a ninth grade level, but it still takes brain power to comprehend bigger words. And here's also where the magic happens. If you, if you dumb down the language to a fifth grader, people will automatically trust you more because you're not trying to use big words. You're explaining things clearly and you're not trying to slide anything past them. So what you can do is run your page through a Flesh Kincaid score like the Hemingway app. I think it's HemingwayApp.com and you're shooting for sixth or fifth grade or below. And that's another helpful SEO tip. Wow, Don, this is amazing. Like, uh, like what you basically cracked a code, like which most businesses are trying to do, like how to get. So in, in, in one year alone, you made like about three and a half million visitors. And that's just like incredible. So my question to you, Don, is like, what is like your motivating factor to like get this to increase uh, as much as possible? Like, I know that you're into teaching math, but is there like a particular drive? that makes you go past things and even if like things are not working like how how does your mindset and thought process work when it was creating math celebrity i'm a big fan of automation and the 80 20 rule and so by nature from my day job years ago I'm, I'm i'm a very lazy person and what i mean by that is if i'm assigned a task i'm instantly going to ask myself is there a faster easier or better way to do this and so when I first started tinkering around with math celebrity, that was my motivation is, you know, I've been in math classes and a lot of people, if you talk to a lot of students, you hear the same four or five things. The lecture's boring. I don't understand the textbook. This is taking too long. These formulas are too difficult. So I asked myself, wouldn't it be nice if you could just pop a problem in a search box, you press the button, and in a split second, you get a step-by-step -step explanation at a fifth grade language level or lower. And not only do you understand it, it helps you get better at math. And I was just playing around with this the first few years, but when I saw the traffic start creeping up and up and up, and then I think the sixth or seventh year, it went from linear to exponential. It's mind-blowing for me because when you can pull little levers in your life and be at health relationships, spirituality, business, any of that. When you can tweak little levers and you see those exponential gains, it, it's so much fun for me. No, that's that that's true. You know, like you have to, I mean, like we're we're all we all want to the path to least resistance and like finding the quicker way, and that is usually through automation, usually gets that. Most people are like one thing I've realized over my lifetime is like most people want to like uh uh work hard. They think hard work will lead to success, but uh, it's usually smart work. Like, like there's so many people working hard. They're not successful. It's like people that are that are using their brains to create the shortcuts and all of that. Like they say, there's no shortcuts to success. But I, I don't know. Like, what do you think about that statement? Like, since you know about automation and all of that, I think there's a certain amount of mental work that that needs to be done. I, I agree with you that people equate hard work with with value and success. But if that was true, then post diggers and and, and ditch diggers and construction workers and roofers that sit out in 110 degrees should be paid the most. But that's just not how the world works. It's the value you create. And, and by the way, that's not to take away from the value of roofers or, or, or post hole diggers. But if we look at value in terms of impact per person times number of people, so you may have a solution that that is a small impact in somebody's life. Maybe it saves them 10 minutes in a day or, or a headache. But if you multiply that by 10, 100, 1,000, a million people, that starts to add up real quick. And so if you go back to the 80-20 rule, you just think about 
in terms of value, what can I do first just to create value, but then how can I scale the value that I'm giving the world? And when you think in those terms, I think that's how you unlock not just not just wealth, but just success and enlightenment in general. So basically, like we have to think in terms of automation and scaling. It's not just like hard work. You have to like use a smart work to like basically get to the goal in the fastest way possible. So yeah, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be automation. I I I, I default to automation, but there's a lot of human to human interaction that you can use eighty twenty. Here's an example. Suppose you're at a networking event. You're an entrepreneur, and you want to make the right connections. Most entrepreneurs, especially introverts, will go into a networking event, maybe take a drink or two to take the edge off, and then they'll kind of edge their way around and look for people they know. The 80-20 of that would be to sit back, enter the room, and pause, and look around for about 30 seconds. Just look around, and I know it's tough for introverts. And what you're looking for is there may be 250 people in that room, but three of them have a crowd around them of seven, eight, nine people or more. That should instantly tell you in the next, let's say you have two hours, the 80-20 is, can you find three to four minutes to go to those three people that have the huge crowd around them, introduce yourself and maybe strike up even, even a two minute conversation. And why do I say that? Because networking is like network. Think of networking as nodes. Like on link, if you go on LinkedIn, you may see a thousand different people, but maybe the top 10 or 15 of them have 30,000 connections or 20,000 really valuable connections, it would serve you so much better to at least make a little time with them than try to scatter your attention everywhere. Because chances are the person with the high network can get you where you want to go or steer you in the right direction faster than random connections can. I mean, uh, uh, this actually reminds me of this one book that I read. Uh, I don't know if you read this book, but like I read this book called The Square and the Tower. Uh, it was a book by this guy and it talks about like networks and hierarchies, right? And how it's like net, it's like networks and you have these clusters, uh, or like some people have clusters around them. And then when you go and interact with those people, you get access to the other connections and then you can basically go and spread your ideas and all of your things re really effectively. What's the hierarchy? There's one person at the top and then everybody else is down beneath. And so like, uh, it was a very interesting book because it basically told about how uh, like like you can create if you have a revolutionary idea you be, the fastest way to do that is through networking and it also talked about social media and also talked about networking but sometimes you get these certain people in certain uh, groups and like certain combinations that help your idea spread like wildfire so yeah it's an interesting thing that I thought about when you were talking about that yeah, Barab Barabasi, I think his name is, has a couple books about network science and clustering and nodes. And he talks about the same thing as if you start, if you dedicate a certain amount of time to the high, high, high volume networks and nodes, you'll see way more progress than you would if you just scatter your attention. Yeah. So, Don, I'm actually like really curious because like you make it sound so simple on how to get like millions of visitors to your like site. But like, why do most companies not do what what you're doing you know because it, it sounds like it sounds relatively simple like google analytics and like typing typing the right words like understanding what they're saying but it seems like companies pay a lot of money to a lot of these people and then they still don't get the results that they're seeking why do you think that is yeah i mean i don't want to sell it easy like i just figured it out and everything took off i mean some of this took years and it, the real traction started happening at year six or seven out of the 16 or so that I've been doing this, but I agree. There's a lot of companies out there selling SEO that, that are not producing the results that they're promising. So that's, that's, that's difficult to deal with. But I think the, the big thing is, can you be in it for the long game? Like, I'll be honest with you. If I, if I could go back in time and do this again, I would not do SEO because it is a lot of work. I would do paid ads and I would do a minimum viable product because I could have tested a lot earlier and saw what my fans wanted versus what they didn't. But to answer your original question, a lot of this is A-B testing. So I'm a huge fan of A-B testing everything in my life from, from the clothes I wear to the introductions I make to, to the business decisions I make. If you can A-B test things, like, it can gets you, tell, you a lot. Can you tell the audience what A-B testing is? Because like I don't think we would know what it is. 
Yeah. So A-B testing is if you hold, let, let's, let's talk about a networking event because that's something everybody understands. Suppose every time you go to a networking event, you wear, and we'll talk about a man, you wear the standard business casual outfit, right? You got the dress shoes, maybe some chinos on, maybe a dress shirt or maybe a polo, right? And you, and we'll keep everything else the same, but A-B testing is, A is called the control. That's what you usually do. B is called a variant. But B is you only change one thing for your test. Everything else you keep the same. So for the A-B test of the networking event for our, for our traditional male would be why not wear a sport coat when you go to the meeting? You go in, you, you talk the same, you're the same guy, same weight, same job, same everything, but now you have a sport coat. Test the response you get from people. And I found if you dress up a little more, you will see a different response, especially from people that are at a higher level than you. Sport coat, whether whether you whether you think clothes affect people's judgment or not, it does. And so, the, I, my favorite quote is: "Society will accept the value you put on yourself." And so, for an A/B test, if you wear the sport coat, you're automatically put more value on yourself because you're dressing better. Another A/B test would be when I go meet new people. Instead of what I usually do is go in and start blabbing about my business instead saying, hi, my name is Don. I'd like to learn more about you. And when you A-B test that over time, maybe you find out that instead of the average conversation at a network event lasting 90 seconds because you're boring people, now you're getting into 10, 12, 15 minute conversations. Don, I, I love the way your brain thinks like, uh, cause mine is kind of similar. Cause I was an elect, I graduated as an electrical engineer. So basically, uh, a lot of people when they're just interacting, they're like, "Oh, just be yourself." It uh, like uh, just be organic. This, this, and that. But if you like study the science of like human interactions and how like how like people interact with each other, usually the favorite thing that uh, the, one of the favorite things that people love to talk about is themselves. The favorite subject of anybody is themselves, and you know it's something really simple, but most people don't realize it, and they just like they just talk about themselves and like you realize that you realize that if you do an A-B test like, or you do a person test, like a lot of the times, unless the other person is really empathetic and like is curious about you, like they really wouldn't care, you know? They, it wouldn't even register unless it's something to do with them. So it's just a thought that I had, you know? Yeah, it's fascinating. And there's nothing wrong with being yourself, but it's almost evaluating. I don't know. I'm a big fan of inversion, which is a, which is a mental model that Charlie Munger had talked about and Warren Buffett. And basically inversion says when you're trying to get better at something, instead of thinking about how you do it good or better or right, think about how you do it wrong and eliminate those things. So for our networking event, if we're not sure how the best social butterflies work, we could ask ourselves when we've been in conversations before, what behaviors have we seen from people that have turned us off? And then write all those down and just stop doing them. We could still be ourselves. We'll just eliminate the bad behaviors. And I find this is a fascinating experiment in life. If you can use inversion on your life and cut out the bad behaviors or the bad traits without even trying to learn how to do anything better, it's almost like the good shines through. So for instance, we go to a networking event, Let, let's apply inversion to our behaviors. How would we turn people off and shorten a conversation? I would have bad breath, right? Because I don't care how good I am at business. Maybe I could be Brad Pitt, but if my breath stinks, those people are going to be out of there quick. I'd have bad breath. I'd have yellow teeth. I'd talk about myself. I'd talk too fast. I wouldn't make eye contact. And so when you piece all these together, you, you start to tell yourself, if I just stop doing these things, I will get so much better, so much faster than I would if I'm trying to mimic the social butterflies. <laughs> No, I love it, Don. Uh, it's it's like, you know, like there's like the extroverts who just think it's all natural. But then it's like for introverts, like I myself am, am an introvert. Like for me, whenever, uh, for instance, like when I first came to America, like the culture here was so radically different. I had to study human interactions here almost like a science. Like I had to know like how people interact with each other. For instance, like uh, I noticed like a pattern. I noticed like in like, let's say in the Middle East or in India, the, the connections tend to be more emotional and heart based. And over here, and like, but it's, they have a exterior shell, but then once you crack through that shell, you become friends for life in uh, the Western world or in America, it's really easy to spark a conversation, but it's on a superficial level when you're trying to, but when you're trying to go deeper, people think that that's weird or awkward and everything. And so there's a process to it. And, and I had to like study like how like uh, social dynamics work. 
And it's like a fascinating subject because you have like these different places. Like let's say you go to a bar, the 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 entire dynamics is different, right? Because let's say you have like a girl who's like really attractive. She's got 10 guys hitting on her. And then if you try to go and talk to her, she'll let us like reject you. But the same person could be in a, a bookstore and you approach them and then they'll be completely nice to you. And it's just like understanding that um, uh, ultimately you got to like do it with the flow. But when you understand the dynamics, it helps you. It helps to a large extent, you know? Yeah, that's a great insight. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, on a different note, Don, I was actually wondering, uh, what is what is the greatest lesson you learned during your years making Matt Celebrity into what it is now, where it's getting millions of visitors? Like when it comes to automation or SEO or about the entire process of making a website uh, become like a, a hit, not just in one country, but in multiple countries, like more than 200 countries. Wow, that's a good question. Uh, probably the biggest lesson I've learned is intention. So we're going to get a little bit woo-woo and spiritual. I hope that doesn't turn your audience off. But no, no. You have to set, yeah, I mean, you have to set an intention of, and I'm not <laughs> big into metaphysics, so a uh, huge fan of Neville Goddard, Think and Grow Rich. But I noticed probably in year eight, so about halfway of the journey from start until now, I started getting in more into metaphysics. And I think the biggest lesson for entrepreneurs or people that want to build a business and scale is you have to set an intention, and but you have to have the energy behind that. So what I mean is, if you just read The Secret, which is a great book, but that cuts to it on a superficial level, which is if I just have an intention and, and, and I just believe and everything will come to me, millions of dollars and adoring fans, but Neville cuts, Neville Goddard cuts deeper into it. And, and when I applied that, I started seeing this. It's can you have the feeling? So one of his biggest books is The Feeling is a Secret. And, and, and the general gist is when I set an intention, let's say I want to make $5 million. That's my goal. I want to build a business. I want to make $5 million because that's a tangible goal. We have to ask ourselves when I make $5 million, so fast forward to whenever that is. What is, the, what is the emotional state I will be in? And then how will my life change? So I'll give you an example. Suppose I had $5 million. I would, I would move a lot slower than I do now. I wouldn't be rushing in the morning to go out to a day job or getting up to run around and do tasks. I would be much more focused and discerning about the things I'm going to do. Secondly, if I had $5 million, I'd be even more relaxed, right? Because I have nothing to prove. One, two, I don't need the money anymore. I mean, if I make money, great, but I don't need the money anymore. And so if you start to think about the person you're going to be at that, whatever future moment that is, but you rewind that that those behaviors and that mindset to now, and you also write down that vision, you can have a vision board, I have a Google Doc, you'll start to see incredible things happen in your life. And it might not be right away. But you will start to see the change within a few weeks to a few months. You'll see behavior changes. You'll see the way you organize your day. I mean, I've seen my diet change, my sleep habits change, all kinds of stuff. And it all starts with the intention plus the feeling. If you combine those two, I think that's the biggest lesson I've learned out of all of this. Well, you bring an interesting point, Don. But here's the thing. Most people don't know what they want. They're just going through life like robots, like they're living without meaning, path and purpose. So what would you advise somebody that wants to get something, but like doesn't know about like how to go about it? Because like, you know, like, as you said, in the secret, like they talk to you about the thoughts and manifesting, but you have to do actions as well to get to that point, right? Like people, when, when they, when people like kept talking about the secret, like they just thought by man, sitting here and manifesting, I'm going to get things done. But that's not usually the case. Like you have to take appropriate actions as well, right? Yeah, actions is part of it, but you bring up a good point. People, people kind of meandering through life and, and they're always thinking about what they don't want. So there's two types of people. There's towards people and they're the way people. I don't know if you've ever heard this. This is an NLP principle, but, but the gist of it is some people are towards people, meaning if you ask them to tell you about what they want, they'll tell you what they want. Like, I want $5 million. I want to weigh 190 pounds. But the people you described are away people. Instead of telling you what they want, they tell you what they don't want. But the way, the way for them to manage that or coaches that deal with that type of person is 
write down everything you don't want and then just think about the opposite. So a perfect example is I used to work with a guy that was really shy and he said, I don't want to be nervous when I go to social interactions. And then I said, okay, so write down all those things. I said, how, what would it look like if you had a good interaction? Instead of saying, why don't you want it? Why don't you work toward a good interaction? I said, what would it look like? Or what stops you? That's a powerful question, by the way. What stops you from having a good interaction? If you talk in terms of, of away language to an away person, you'll start to get to the towards piece. So for people that are have a negative mindset or are timid and, and think a lot about what they don't want, write down what you don't want. Start with that. But then think about what stops me from getting to that other paradigm. So maybe I'm shy. What stops me from getting to be an extrovert? And as you write this down and think about behaviors, you'll start to shift your, your daily routine. No, I totally, I totally agree. You know, like you have to, like, it's interesting that you bring up NLP because I, uh, like I read a few books about NLP and it was like a really fascinating subject. Right. Um, but ultimately, but ultimately we have to, as you mentioned, have intention and feeling and go about doing that. But Don, I wanted to ask you, like, uh, whatever you're, you're talking about right now is so practical. Um, like basically like SEO automation, getting website traction. So don't you think that in college, in American colleges all across America, like I know you, you taught math in college, right? Or like, was it college or high school? Well, I was a math major, but I did I did not teach math in college. Okay, so like when you realize, right, like you're a math major in co in, uh, in college, like you basically realize that instead of that, like people could should be teaching the professors in the colleges should be teaching what you what what you're what what you're just describing right now, like how to get more visitors, how to get more traction, how to succeed in your business and all that. Like if this is taught in colleges, then there would be like a revolution in the way people do businesses. Well, what are your thoughts on that? On that? I agree. I think some of the curriculum needs to be focused more on, on on practical things like balancing your checkbook, how to make better investments, how to choose your career, how to how to build a business. And unfortunately, it's not. So you bring up a good point. But to answer your original question on why more people don't do this, I think I think it was Jeff Bezos who asked Warren Buffett. He said, "You're investing. You're investing." Uh, mindset is so simple. Why don't more people follow it? And he said, because it's boring, right? A lot of people want the sexy, glamorous solution to stuff when a lot of it is just like for working out, maybe it's just sweat equity or maybe for business, it's just taking an hour a week, sitting down and being real with yourself and saying, where am I weak? Like what am, what, what is holding me back from being the person I want to be? And that's a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people. I mean, I, I had to do it years ago when I was looking at, I think my wife took a photo of me when I, when I turned 35 and I was like, that's not the 25 year old me. And I could have just said, Oh, it's the camera angle. But I'm like, no, I have to make changes. I've got to, I've got to ingest less caffeine. I got to be less stressed. I got to eat less bread. And as soon as you have those honest conversations with yourself and they're not easy, but as soon as you have those conversations with yourself, the the healing and the, and the progress can begin. It's just it's tough for people to sit down and look in the mirror and admit I, I I'm I'm lacking in this because they almost look at it as like a failure. But to go back to NLP, one of the major principles of NLP is there is no failure; it's only feedback. And so if you treat it as feedback, right? I tried something that didn't work, or I tried something that sort of worked. It's almost like a heat-seeking missile, right? You're you're never directly on course, but it's constantly guiding in closer and closer to the goal you want. No, um, yeah, that's 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 pretty true. Um, I I do think that we need to like, especially when it comes to like what we were talking about, like in terms of college education. I do believe that like uh like the financial education, like what you just mentioned right now, is more pertinent, right? Like it's more about thoughts and actions and how to basically uh, go about that uh, and then go about starting a business. Because ultimately that's the only thing that's going to get you free is like building value, giving value. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, in college, one thing that I, I'm surprised more colleges don't do or even people don't do is suppose you're a junior in college, right? And next year you're going to be a senior. I, it's It's mind boggling why more juniors don't find somebody that just graduated and say, hey, You've been out of college for a year. You're now in the workforce. If you could rewind time as a senior, what are the things you would do and what would you stop doing? 
and get a mentor like that. Because now when the junior graduates or goes into senior year and they've seen someone successful, they can avoid the bad behaviors and take on more good behaviors. And the same thing works in, in high school, right? Right before you go to college, go find somebody that, that, that went to college and is having a good year and say, hey, what would you have done senior year differently and what would you have kept doing? No, to, uh, totally. Like, uh, but I think like the the thing is, John. Like a lot of like people in college, like they're they're there to just like ha like be in, like to like make friends and all of that stuff. Like the first half of college is just basically party time and like making uh and networking and all of that. Like I feel like they become serious uh, sometime after it, you know. So, that's true. Yeah. So, Don, uh, quick question. So, when it comes to like financial education. Um, and like basically like uh, basically uh, in terms of like American universities, like having like a revolution, like what is the one thing you would advise like a student who's going to go in to get like, let's say like uh, an arts degree or, or some other degree that's not STEM related. And then they rack up a hundred thousand dollars in debt and then they have to like pay it off like for the next, I don't know how many ever years, like let's say you had to advise somebody that's just going into college and like from what you know now about about just like business and like SEO and automation, how would you go about advising such a person? I would, I would future pace, I would future pace their, their life after college. So I'd say, okay, after four years, you're going to have $105,000 in debt. You have an art degree. Here's the potential jobs you can get. And even if you get a job at a top tier firm, here's how much you're going to make after taxes. It will cost you, and you just lay that out on paper very simply. It will cost you 18 years, assuming you keep the job at top tier and don't get fired, to even make a dent in the debt you have to, to pay off the interest and start denting into the principal. Are you sure this is something you want to do? And, and again, some people are not money driven. So even if you show them that practical example, it just it will not sink in. But it, it helps to paint the picture of if you if you continue down this path. This is where you'll be financially. And I don't think I don't think people look out that far, like you said in college, but you can even you can even zoom in the lens and saying, in the next year or two, here's how much debt you're gonna rack up versus the income you're gonna have. And you'll only have enough money left over for maybe ramen noodles and then one night out to eat. No, yeah, that's that's pretty uh that's pretty true. Like I myself went into a STEM major, right? But ultimately, like a lot of people around me, like they were they they were having the party time and they were having fun but then now they come out of college and now they have all this debt to pay off but they go but the means of getting out of debt is through business and financial education or like basically learning something like how to do seo because when you have like a lot of people because in the 21st century right now websites are everything this is the most important like one of the reasons i was honored to have you on the show is because in the 21st century Website traffic is one of the most important things in buying a product. If you don't buy, if you cannot get people to draw attention to your to your website, you're not going to be able to sell anything in the first place. I deeply believe that this should be taught in university and colleges all across. So yeah, yeah, it'd be nice if there was an SEO course. That'd be great for especially for college students that are going to be entrepreneurs, right? If they learn that in college, they can have a jump ahead of the market when they graduate. That's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe you should start a course in college about it, you know, because, yeah, it, it would probably, like, change a lot of things. But, Don, I wanted to ask you about, uh, speaking of this, I wanted to ask you about your book. I know you wrote this book called Free Traffic Frenzy, How to Get Full 50,000 Website Visitors. Can you tell me and the audience a little bit more about the premise of this book, how you started it, what the book is about? Yeah, I had, I had. I was probably in my 10th or 11th year of math celebrity and I wrote my first book just explaining how I got started and then the math equations and shortcuts. And I started getting more, more questions from people on how did you get five, six, seven, eight million visitors in a year without spending any money on traffic? And after, after having that conversation over and over again, I thought to myself, why not just write a book, right? And help people out. Cause I have your mindset. I want to help younger people out and not, and not have them go through the struggles I went through. So it was basically just a how-to manual of what I did. And it's some of the things we've already talked about, like Google Analytics, Flesh Kincaid score, um, internal search, things like that. But it's just how it, not only what I did right, but more importantly, what I did wrong. And, and so we go back to inversion and what not to do. 
So it's almost like a, a dear, dear Don letter from the future, but for entrepreneurs that are, that are starting a business that want to grow traffic. So I had, I'd written, I, I, it took probably a couple months to write, but one of the things I'm most proud of is if you go to the Amazon reviews, one of the biggest pieces of nice feedback I got was this is so simple to read and is jargon free because a couple people hired an SEO agency and they said all they got was jargon and little results. But some of the reviews said this was the easiest thing in the world to read. It wasn't talking above my head and it actually got me results. So I was really proud of that. Wow. I mean, I'm definitely going to I'm definitely going to advise my audience to take a look at that and apply it to their own websites and businesses, because this is in the 21st century with everything being automated on websites. This is probably the most important thing you can learn about. So, yeah. So, Don. Is there like any project or work that you're doing right now that you want the audience to get a glimpse of? Yeah, I mean, probably the biggest, I'm working on two things. So first I'm working on uh, a second or my fifth book, which is, has to do with mental models. And this goes back to what I talked about, inversion, 80-20, things like that. And then the second big project I'm working on is a mobile app for my math celebrity site because more than a few fans have asked for that. So those are my two biggest projects in the next six months. That is, that is awesome, Don. So Don, uh, how can my audience get to know more about you and Matt Celebrity and all the work that you're doing? Besides, with you? yeah, probably the easiest way is LinkedIn. I mean, I'm on, I'm on TikTok, Instagram, but LinkedIn is the best way. So it's linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash D-O-N-S-E-V-C-I-K. D O N S E V C I K. Okay. So Don, I'm really, really glad you took the time to like come to this podcast and share your insights on SEO automation and how you got to where you're going. I mean, you're definitely like an extraordinary American. And like, basically I think a lot of people can gain value from what you just uh, talked about over here. I would definitely want you back at a later time on this show. Thanks. I had a blast. I really appreciate the invite and I love to come back and help out your audience more. Yeah. And uh, I want, I want to conclude this show by telling my full story Americans that look, there's an story with each and every one of us. It's our duty to awaken it and unleash it until next time. Bye for now. Hey there, everyone. Thank you for watching story America. If you like what you see, please do subscribe to our podcast and share it with others. Remember that the best investment that you can make in your lifetime is in your own financial education for it is knowledge that truly sets you free also remember that uh, your purchasing power is being diluted through inflation and then the practical thing to do is to protect the loss of your purchasing power by investing in precious metals or the right cryptocurrencies also never forget that you are an extraordinary american we'll see you in the next episode bye for now